you guys for joining us. We have a ton of people here, which is awesome. I'm having trouble see, scrolling through and seeing all the names and all the faces and all the people here. So this is amazing. Thank you for turning out, coming out, joining us. I'm waiting for Brian just to join us and I'm gonna uh, turn it over to him, but I wanted to kick things off since you guys uh, are here and it's two o'clock and we wanna get started. So Brian will be joining ben, us. Then I'm on. Oh, there you are. I I'm on under, it's under Unscared Inc. <laughs> awesome. Now I see you. Sorry, there's just so many people on no here. No problem. Like, going through the faces and the names, looking at everyone. But yeah, I just want to uh, sincerely thank you guys for um, joining us. We're doing an entire month of breath work. So the entire month of October is dedicated to talking about and exploring and really getting into the practice of breath work. So one of the things I love about my job of neurohacker is getting to geek out and, and get into the research and science and all of the cool stuff we do, but where I really um, get excited and, and love exploring is when we can make it practical and applicable and get it to impact your life. So getting out of the inspiration and education mode and getting into the practice and putting these things into your life, into practice, so you can see the massive benefits uh, that all these practices can have. And breathwork is just in one of those areas that uh, is so fundamental. Um, we breathe all day long unconsciously and don't think about it, but when you can really harness the power of that breath and pick up these skills and learn to control your nervous system and your physiology and control your anxiety and your fear and, and really breathe through all these things, so much of your world is uh, unlocked and open to you. And I've had some profound experiences uh, through some breath workshops that I've done. And I'm super excited to bring you this content. And I'm super excited to bring you these people. We have an amazing lineup of people um, all entire month. So every single Wednesday of October, 2 p.m., we're going to be doing these on Zoom. Uh, Brian is kicking us off. And this is perfect to kick this off because he's really going to go into the science and understanding of how this all works, uh, how, how doing these practices, doing this breath work can change your physiology and give you control over these parts of your body and parts of your life. So I'm super excited. Uh, Brian's going to be kicking this off. Next week, we have Mark Devine. Um, he's going to be uh, leading a workshop. The week after that is Casper van der Mulen, which I'm very excited about. And then finally, Marcel Hoff, um, Wim Hoff's brother, who has been doing breath work a long time as well, is going to be... Um, if, uh, capping off the month of October. So I'm super uh, excited to bring you all these people just to introduce them to you because they're all phenomenal and you should be following um, them and their work. They're amazingly uh, inspirational and just bring a ton of value uh, to the community. So I'm excited to introduce you to them and I'm excited for you guys to pick up these new skills of what breath work can do for you um, and in your life. And I really want to encourage you guys um, not just uh, have this in a window on your computer and kind of <laughs> doing other things, but not only pay attention and really get into this and, and follow along, but really do the practice um, as, as we get into those. Because this is really as much a somatic feeling experience with this breath work stuff as it is uh, cerebral understanding of it. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Brian. And him, let him kick us off. All right, Brian, go ahead and unmute. I'm going to... Yep. You. Yes. Good. All right, Ben, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and Neurohacker, appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate um, it. Um, if you so are not you muted, mute. I would suggest you mute now. <laughs> or Ben, I think you may have the, the ability to control. And yes, I'm going to mute everyone that's not, just so we can hear you clearly. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to go over the science behind breath work. Um, I have, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to run through as much as I can. Um, I'm going to move fast to so take notes. Um, I will go slower on the stuff of great importance here. Um, Sorry, I think I unmuted you by accident there. So if you don't have a clue as to why I'm here, I'm going to quickly run through my background. I am currently CEO and partner at Shift, um, where I've spent the vast majority of my career, which is 20 plus years in human performance, um, looking at things in an, uh, that um, might have been right in front of us, that, but we may not have just been paying attention to. And that's why we stumbled into breathing. And that's why I stumbled into breathing. Um, roughly about close to a decade ago now. Um, I'm a co-author of three books, Power, Speed, Endurance, Unbreakable Runner, and Unplugged. I have started a, uh, a foundation 
dedicated to understanding and learning more about what it is we are going to go over today. I have no connection towards methodology. And we are very in, in invested in understanding why things work the way they do um, and are very aware that a lot of different methods, which you're going to get dosed with, <laughs> um, and, and the uh, the next layer of, um, you know, I know from Mark and then the Hoff, um, Hoff's Wim's brother. Um, so I'm going to give you a general understanding of why they work and what they do and how you can actually understand in greater detail the tool that you are using that is called breath. Um, so we've got, I've been involved in a number of research projects. I've been contracted by Stanford Medicine at the Huberman Lab to work on f the FEAR study. Um, there's stuff in the pipeline for more there. Uh, Cal State University Fullerton, CO2 tolerance and state anxiety, which is headed to ARB. It was a thesis paper. Um, that's a big one for us because it is a predictor of the test I will kind of go over at some point in this presentation. Um, we worked the Henderson, Kentucky Fire Department on a firefighter performance study, and then we are currently on hold but have one going forward with San Francisco State University on the on gut microbiome and breath control as we think there might be something there. Nonetheless, moving forward. We are going to start with a broad, I'm going to get this out of the way so that this makes uh, un, uh, the rest of the presentation a lot more understandable. The cure for anything is understanding. Make that clear. We are a species that thinks we have control or behaves as though we have control of things that we truly do not. Um, and so... I've got a very good friend of mine who has a very good quote that is perfect for this. The things we can't understand, we can't control, even if How the world be ours. control them. Okay? That means that if you actually could control something you understood or didn't understand, you could not control it because without the understanding towards something, you can't do anything with it. That is why I am invested in breathing in the capacity that I am, is I want to understand how it works and how we can manipulate it and how work with it with what we're currently dealing with. So science behind breath work, um, the how and why does breathing work? We are going to kick this off real quickly with a breathing exercise. <laughs> so wherever you are at, Stay there. Um, if, if you're laying down, it's probably better to be seated or standing. Here's what we're going to do. This is very simple, and it's to, it's to create an effect for you. And all is you are doing is you are going to check your pulse. Your pulse, the quickest way to check it, is on the carotid artery, which runs right next to your larynx, your throat. And if you take your two fingers, you can find it and you can find your pulse, all right? Don't worry about it right now. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do three breaths following me right now. In through the nose, out through the nose. So all the way in and then all the way out. Nothing special. All the way in, all the way out. All the way in, all the way out. Hold your breath on the exhale. Now, stomp your feet holding your breath as long as you can. Keep stomping your feet as long as you can until you need to breathe. Stomp, stomp, stomp as fast as you can. Stomp, 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 stomp. I'm going to give you a few more seconds. Keep going no matter where you're at. Okay, here we go. Stop. Inhale through the nose, all the way in, and all the way out. All the way in, all the way out. Hold your breath, stomp your feet as fast as you can. 
Stomp, 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 holding your breath on the exhale. Stomp, 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 stomp. Go as fast as you can, no matter where you're at, seated or standing. Go, 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 go. Keep going, 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 going. And no matter where you are at, inhale. And exhale. Hold your breath. Stomp your feet as long as you can. Now, keep stomping your feet. When you need to breathe, stop stomping your feet. Find that carotid artery, find your pulse, and just feel it. Don't do anything else. Do not do anything else. Don't control anything. Don't change anything. Just feel that pulse. I want you to feel it. We're going to stay here for, I don't know, 15, 30 seconds, right? Just feel your pulse and be aware of it. What do you feel as you're feeling that pulse? What are the things that are racing through your brain that you're coming up with right now? You don't need to write them down. So don't, don't feel like you need to write this stuff down. Just be aware of what you're feeling right now from ramping yourself up metabolically. Okay, moving forward. Just hold on to that because we are going to come back to that and do something very differently. What, what we're talking about today is not new. There is nothing new in the breathing space that has not been talked about at least for 5,000 years or more. The problem is, is the disconnection that has occurred as esoteric worlds or societies have played the game or introduced these concepts, meaning, or using the analogies or the methodologies of yoga, becoming a monk, tai chi, free diving, mountaineering, and performance. All of these things have largely been using these along with any and most of the martial arts. They have long understood the benefits of what it meant to control their breathing, and they did not need grant money in order to study this. So, even though we are going to, I am going to bring up some, some research today, there are plenty of people that are very aware of things due to what they understood by actually participating in these practices, okay? And many, there are many, there are thousands of different practices, okay? The critical thing for understanding today and what we're after is the law of nature, not a law, the law. It is adaptation. Adaptation simply is a change or the process of change by which an organism or species becomes better suited in its environment, regardless of that environment. Another answer, to solve a problem or survival. Every organism on this planet is in a fight for survival at its most fundamental level. Even if we were, we were to remove the need to survive. Welcome to being a human being in today's day and age. We don't need to survive, but we still at our core have the need for survival. Okay. So Human beings have a hardwired response for this in what is called the suffocation alarm response, and nobody is immune from it. Everybody has this response. This response is largely predicated off of CO2 tolerance, okay, or carbon dioxide. This is directly connected to our pH as well. And I'll get into that in a little bit. So CO2 tolerance, this is important. The ability to endure progressively rising levels of CO2 without resulting in unwanted psychometabolic reactivity. That is a mouthful, but that means psychologically, and physiologically, I'm not having ill responses or panicking or freaking out. 
Okay. So if I have somebody who is panicking or freaking out or dealing with anxiety, I can give you, I can tell you right now, based on the thousands of people we've been able to touch and work with, that they have a very, very um, high, high sensitivity to CO2, especially in that moment. Okay. Carbon dioxide has normally been called the waste product of cellular respiration, carbonic or, or it's carbonic acid in the blood. We exhale what happens with that carbonic acid as it then diffuses and comes out as a gas. We have, re, we have kind of renegotiated the terms on what CO2 actually is, and we are calling it the metabolic stress messenger of the body. So too much CO2 and we panic, or a CO2 change that we don't like and we panic. This equals not enough air or a pH change. The body will do whatever it can in order to keep pH within a very, very narrow range, okay? Cognitive health and metabolic function, our physiology, are inseparable components of a unified system that is also known as you. They are not two different things. So we like to think in terms of specialization, meaning psychology and physiology. You cannot have one without the other. So if we have psychology without any introduction of physiology, we are missing a very large scope of things. A good friend, Michael, um, Dr. Michael Gervais, has his, he's a psychologist by trade, but he, he uh, minored or got his bachelor's in physiology. And I was like, wow, what a great <laughs> combination. And he said, yeah, it was the physiology that led me to the psychology. So it makes sense um, for him. Nonetheless, we like to separate things. There is no separation inside the system, Okay. Uh, 90% of all energy in the human being and all obligate aerobes, meaning anything that uses oxygen as a means for moving energy, um, is regulated through pulmonary ventilation, our respiratory system, okay? CO2 is not a waste product. It actually makes oxygen available. You cannot get oxygen biologically available without carbon dioxide, yet too much CO2 and pH change could happen and death can ensue. So there's a very fine place in there. So why do we breathe? I'm going to use a quote from Bruce Lipton. If you haven't read his book on the biology of belief, I suggest you uh, maybe write that one down. It's a fantastic book. It's a quick read. Here's his quote. The universe is, is one indivisible, indivisible dynamic whole in which the energy in which energy and matter are so deeply entangled, it is impossible to consider them as independent elements. This goes back to thinking that psychology or physiology or even mechanics or movement are inseparable. They are not. And nothing is actually inseparable, especially for something that is generating or moving energy. Okay. We are nothing more than the universe being experienced through human form, okay? So we are moving energy through a deal that was made 2.5 billion years ago through evolution to use oxygen in, in one of the most efficient processes we can actually, we don't even totally understand. That, but it is so efficient that it has not changed in that amount of time, right? So it's, it's, an, it's pretty incredible that we have this system. So let's look at the neurobiological component of this and understand why we actually take a breath and how this actually works with inside the mechanism of this complexity of the brain. I am not going to get into the deep minutia here. That is something saved for somebody like a Dr. Andrew Huberman who, um, if you do not follow him, you probably should. Uh, I, have a, I have a very good relationship with him, um, and it is through this work that we have a very good relationship, but he can get into a lot of the minutia of this stuff. I am going to give a broad, overarching um, look at this, and we like to look at it from a top-down perspective and how it works, okay? 
So first, I want you to consider the fact of what a day might look like on autopilot, okay? And by autopilot, I mean this. There is a ton of stuff that we all do every single day that we don't even think about. Okay. And so I'm going to drop this early, even though I think I have it in, in a little bit later, but the entire goal of the nervous system is autonomy. Never forget that. That means a pattern and patterns don't define us. They're just efficient in things we've done. Okay. So consider this, you wake up, you look at social media, you do email and messages. You get dressed, get the kids going if you have kids, breakfast, coffee, social media, email, messages, workout, shower, get dressed, commute to work, listen to more media, meetings, social media again, new client, client leads, email, messages, skip lunch, go to lunch, pick up kids, meetings, practice, sport, you know, kids practice, contracts you have to develop, travel, social media, commute home, dinner, work on a relationship, then go to bed. A lot of these things are just all compiled things that we've literally gotten used to doing, all right? Now, let's take a look at the brain and how the brain <laughs> operates. The neocortex, or the newest part of the brain, the part that really makes us human, which is actually the prefrontal cortex, is where working memory, reason, cognition, and our stories occur, okay? Our limbic system is where emotions, long-term memory, behavior, and get this one dialed in, olfaction occur, okay? The brain stem is where our respiration centers are, along with a number of other things that are all where messages outflow, okay? Connected into that, those respiration centers are lesions that, that are set up with chemoreceptors inside the aort, largely inside the aortic, which is near, right off the heart, and the carotid, we felt that earlier, arteries. These are major arteries, okay? And it's very important to understand that when we're talking about the arterial system, that this is a guessing game or a predictive system. Because nothing has happened. It would be the venous system that would tell us what is happening and where the blood becomes deoxygenated and where there is more carbon dioxide that we inevitably have in the bloodstream. So what happens is, is in that brain, we have detectors set up that actually connect into these chemoreceptors in the arterial system. And this means we must develop a relationship to this gas the gas that is triggering us when to breathe. So when I had you run in place, when you were holding your breath, you did not draw a breath for any reason whatsoever due to oxygen. You did it because of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is that stress messenger telling you, hey, stuff's building up more. You also have multiple areas in the brain that pick up this chemoreception because the brain being so important that it will also start to pick up higher levels of CO2 and you'll start to react. And the, the, the number one way for us to react is to ventilate. Therefore, ventilation becomes the most important thing we've got because it is why we are alive. Because why are we alive? Because we are moving energy. Energy is at the core of everything we do. Our deal was made millions of years ago, billions of years ago. Today, what we are is moving energy 90% through aerobic cellular respiration. The other 90% is anaerobic. So, the journey of oxygen, and now looking at the physiology of this, here is the perception of what happens with the journey of oxygen. I inhale, some sort of magic occurs, and I can do work. And this is how we behaviorally have operated, especially with inside performance, not even inside the performance world. Maybe for people who don't even participate in sport or even exercise at all, 
don't ever really think about this. And thus the need or what happens is, is we do not become aware of our breathing until it becomes too late or it becomes a necessity to actually care about it, right? And so that magic area that we have is really a, a problem child um, because behavior gets set up in here due to what, and I'll take a step back, that predictive nature of what CO2 does. And so when I, don't, when I have a poor relationship to CO2, I actually have a very quick or overly sensitive response to this. And I tend to breathe or over breathe a little bit more than normal. And for some people, that's a lot bit more. So the reality of the journey of oxygen is this. I inhale the air, mostly oxygen, right? So, well, 21% oxygen. It enters into my lungs where O2 goes in. CO2 comes out. This is where diffusion occurs. Right here is where you need to understand and go look into what's called the Haldane effect. When I bring in more oxygen, I actually am allowing for more of the carbon dioxide to come out. Okay. So that's important because you actually want to offload what is necessary metabolically from that standpoint. Now, moving into the bloodstream where the new oxygen is picked up, it's in the hematocrit or the red blood cell. The O2 goes in, the CO2 now comes in where that oxygen is needed and knocks it out. This is called the Bohr effect. And this is another principle that we need to understand is that there is a dissociative effect that is created. And this is the yin yang concept, okay? So there's a dissociative effect that happens when CO2 enters the red blood cell and oxygen now gets delivered to the cells or the mitochondria for work. The greatest hack you can do for your mitochondria is actually to control your breathing because you are now feeding the cells, the mitochondria, more oxygen. This is what all these yogis, the Tai Chi, the martial artists, the free divers, the, out, the people who are mountaineers have all figured out very early on, okay? So the easiest way to understand this is very simple. The nose, K-N-O-W-S, nose. The nose creates a, a lower respiration rate by nature, okay? Meaning naturally, it, you slow your respiration rate down. What doesn't happen is you don't actually increase more oxygen into the system or into the lungs. What happens is, is you restrict more of the carbon dioxide out slows this, this, this rhythm down, and it actually allows for that dissociative effect to happen in the blood, which is also known as the Bohr effect. That dissociative effect becomes more pronounced the better you get at this, okay? So the, we get an optimal CO2 tolerance by doing predominant, predominantly all of our breathing through the nose, and we have better O2 utilization or bioavailability as a result of this, regardless of what we are doing. We filter the air. You have nose hair and cilia in the nose. In fact, you have as much nose hair and cilia follicles that you do in your nose as you do on your head. That should be shocking to most of you. You have a mu mucus system that is the front line of defense for all air that is brought in, including B cells, things that actually killer T cells, all of these things that are responsible for actually combating viruses and bacteria that enter in through the air. Okay. Our immune system, this is our immune system's first response. The hum we humidify and warm the air. Sinuses have a very important role in how we process air. We get better diaphragm control, which equals better movement patterns. It's very easy for me to talk and sit in a very poor position because I can offload 
that CO2 a lot quicker. If I'm not, and I'm in a poor position and I'm breathing through my nose, I want to sit up because it, it allows me to get better air. So this is a very good idea to really wrap around our head and our movement practices, regardless of what they are, in understanding how to get a full breath while breathing through my nose in most of the things that we're doing. This will define a lot of things that are going on with you mechanically. So let's look at the autonomic nervous system. This is still part of physiology and what we can control and getting a very good understanding of this idea of control. When we talk about the sympathetic nervous system, we use a, an image of a mouth open like that. Because the moment that you open your mouth, you actually engage more of the sympathetic nervous system. Okay? So this engages our flight, fight, freeze response. We react instantaneously. There is a time and a place for everything. There is a time and a place for mouth breathing. When is it necessary is only defined by you. Okay? When we talk about the parasympathetic nervous system, this is our rest, digest, process, creativity. This is where we're in control of just about everything here, okay? We use a nose because the moment that we start breathing through the nose, we engage more parasympathetic tone. This instantly changes how the heart beats, okay? How the heart changes. The heart will change from mouth breathing to nose breathing pretty quickly, okay? This is a very important thing to understand in terms of um, like, you know, I mean, me, me today talking to you guys, um, I will, go, I am going into a heightened arousal state due to the fact that I am talking and offloading carbon dioxide. So my system now defaults more towards using carbohydrate and, and glycogen. I'm still using glucose, but I'm still going more towards glycogen. I, to a, a, as an energy standpoint, which is leaning me more sympathetic in nature. So I have more sympathetic tone due to the fact that I'm talking. I've worked with plenty of uh, stand up comedians and high level presenters who have always had trouble coming down after they've done a talk or done a set on stage. And that is the biggest thing that we've implemented is getting these folks to do some sort of breathing immediately after they've finished so that they can come down off that ride of being really revved up. Okay. So the other way to think of the, you know, to think of um, our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system is, have you ever seen anybody freak out looking at a sunset? And the answer is no. You have not, um, unless they were in grave danger and we're no longer looking at the sunset. But the reason that is, is because from a, from a visual standpoint, you're peripheral and it drops you down versus if I am looking at my phone like this, I instantly go into a high sympathetic or more sympathetic tone. It, I, it's an instant change that my system, my senses use. Okay. My senses are largely there by design for all of this stuff. Sympathetic, parasympathetic, right? Like visually, I see a bear. Visually, I see a fire. Visually, I see something and I need to react to it. If I hear something, somebody screaming, a child screaming, I instantly change, right? If I hear nature, birds chirping, I downshift, right? I eat something rancid. I touch something sharp. These are reactions to all of my senses for how I'm supposed to react in my primary emotions, right? All animals that are basically mammals um, have this in them. Their senses are how we program largely the, emo the primary emotions, right? That means that most animals experience these emotions, except humans, where we have that prefrontal cortex. When you go back to, to the brain and the story side of stuff, what the problem is, is that we get inter interlaced here is the thinking that we get involved in and the storytelling that we get involved in with ourselves and we overthink things and start to question or start to worry more or start to uh, think ill will upon ourselves 
And this is this also has emotional responses to it, right? Animals by and large don't do this. We are the only animal that does that. Okay. And so it's really important to understand this because what I've so far gone over is ways to actually grab a hold of your nervous system and change that. Okay. That is the importance of breathing because it is so fast and it can so quickly change how our nervous system is responding to things. I can't change your thinking, but if I could convince you to just count, count your breaths and slow your breathing in a situation you didn't like, I bet you can't do anything much more than control your breathing and count them. And that's how you actually can grab a hold of something, right? So consider the fact of a lot of the things we do all day, including being in front of a screen and then wanting to come down and chill out, or then we want to do some sort of hard workout. And yet I've been in front of something like this, giving myself high sympathetic uptick all day. And my idea to change that is to go and work out really hard and stimulate the same system, but in a different manner. And this is where a lot of us run into trouble, including myself in the past, right? Like until I started to really understand how to manage this stuff and understand how breathing plays has a role in that. So again, I want to reiterate the entire goal of the nervous system is autonomy. And in fact, it's protective autonomy. It's there to protect you. You're there hardwired, your brainstem, your motor patterns get set. And if you can really think about this, here's a very simple way to look at it. You cannot unlearn to ride a bike. You cannot unlearn how to swim. You certainly can get in over your head in riding your bike, meaning if you're riding something too technical or over your head for the technicality of that bike, your bike riding skills or your swimming skills, consider that you've never been in the ocean, but you know how to swim. And if you were to enter the surf and it was too big and you didn't know how to navigate that, that might change things. But the fact is, is you still know how to swim and you still know how to ride a bike. How well you choose to do those things is the change that happens. And so these are the programmable, protective, autonomous systems that we have in place that we don't like to change because it requires work. And all work really requires a behavioral change first. So looking at the brain and brain energy and, and thinking about how we really go about our days, including being in front of screens all the time, right, is the brain carries 2% of, of the body weight. In, by and large, as, as the populace, it is 20% of total energy demand. But <laughs> hold on. There are plenty of people that it becomes way more than that. So it strictly runs on glucose. It'll use ketones as well, but basically the brain and nervous system function off of glucose. At 2,000 kcals a day, that's 400 calories at rest, okay? Consider this with master chess players, okay? They can burn up to 6,000 calories a day in a chess match. Just sitting at a table, playing hardcore chess. Our idea of what calories are is very skewed or how they're created is very skewed. And so we have to really start to look at things very differently. But the fact is, is all energy is tied up in through how we breathe and what, what's, what energy we are using for the system, whether I'm faulting more towards anaerobic or aerobic. And these systems aren't blanketed one or the other. It really is how much of one and the other. So different tasks require different energy requirements. Intense work is going to require more intense energy, faster energy. It's there for a reason. You have a savings account. We typically use the aerobic system and anaerobic system as, as a model of the checking account as our aerobic system, our savings account as our, is our anaerobic system. So when oxygen is not present, be it through work demand or over breathing, okay, the system answers one way. And that is anaerobically with more sympathetic tone. 
You have no choice. This is how it actually works. Okay. There is no if, and, but, or about. So the, the interesting thing is, is if I stand up right now, I actually engaged more anaerobic cellular respiration in the tissue that instantly created more demand for work because I have not picked up my ventilation and there was not enough oxygen in the system, but there's more carbon dioxide now getting created. So that then starts to change as the effort continues and how fit I actually am. So this is the importance of things like warmups, et cetera. But the, the flip side of this is, be, and I've already gone over this with you, is if I'm sitting there all day breathing out of my mouth or talking to people, guess what? I've done the exact same thing all day. If I am offloading an exorbitant amount of carbon dioxide that is not necessary, the system does not care. It does not, it has no bias. It just flips and moves more towards carbohydrate use and more anaerobic energy. It's that simple. It doesn't mean you're completely anaerobic. You're still using some oxygen. It's just the system is now moving more towards this use and it's using a lot of the precious resources that you have in that savings account, all right? So here's something interesting as well. It's, we like to think that there's a difference between working out high energy and consider it like an argument or an emotional outburst, or I'm having, a, uh, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with work, et cetera, et cetera. These are actually the same thing. So our state is largely affected by either or. And so state becomes the intersection between biology and behavior. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is our state or what is your state and what can you control if you want it to change? And the, the critical thing to understand here is that you have more control than you actually think. It's we're so pulled back from what's going on inside because of how much we're using in front of us, technology, medicines, um, all these things are distracting us from what we innately are very capable of understanding. In fact, every single bit of technology that you probably wear or put on or have, have played with is based off of you and what you do physiologically and biologically. And at no point so far has anything done it better than you. But we're with this idea that we're going to do that. Does that mean that we get rid of the technology and all that? No, we use it in a way to learn from it, or we just don't use it so that we can actually start to understand how we feel so that we understand how we feel versus going to a device to tell us how we feel, right? So autonomic tone is how we actually can grab a hold of this thing and using our nervous system. And so we, you, we, most people like to think of autonomic tone. So sympathetic or parasympathetic is like a light switch. And it's more like a dial that moves left or right and sympathetic, parasympathetic over here, right? And depending on where you're at, that's how we move it, okay? So between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose, our response. In our response lies the growth to our freedom. That is Viktor Frankl. Why are we in the place that we are in with all of this stuff? Pretty much because we are distracted via social media, media outlets, adrenal addiction, exercise addiction, alcohol, drugs, money, workaholism, the in entertainment industry, um, popularity, all, fame, all of these things distract us. It doesn't mean any one of them are bad. It just means we get over uh, stimulated by these things. And so when you look at us, we are a species that is overstimulated with almost no metabolic cost these days. And we learn and, and it, we, we've learned to enslave ourselves through this thing of abundance. 
and we still fight for survival on a base layer, even though we don't have to work at survival on a non-base layer or non-fundamental layer. So it appears that for the first time in our history, we can create problems and disease and within the same breath, take zero responsibility for it and victimize ourselves for the very thing that we are creating every single day. I don't want to feel the way I am, but I'm going to jump in front of my screen and look at my likes and see who's doing what and what's going on. And this pattern repeats itself, or I'm going to blame the food industry for me sticking things in my face that I probably shouldn't be sticking in my face because I haven't actually done the work or worked metabolically enough for said calories, right? We're in a very different time. And there's a very good study that's done on this. Um, and I'll, I'll bring them up at the end. Um, we're getting close there. So um, that, that was done on gas exchange between um, animals in the natural environment and human beings and what actually our blood gases look like. And it is frightening how poorly our blood gases have gotten. Um, it, it's just, it, it, and, and guess how that's regulated? Breathing, right? So training tool, breath test. We use a breath test. It's for free. It's on shiftadapt.com. Um, there, I'm not going to go through it right now, but I will talk about it. We use a CO2 tolerance test. We are in the middle of getting this understood as a way to understand state anxiety. Um, even in pr- professional athletes, we've seen this. The CO2 tolerance test or the breath test calculator is simply a test where we train. We, we stole this from the free diving world. Again, like I said, Nothing is new. Um, the free diving world has been using a max exhale test for eons in order to set CO2 and O2 tables. We've been able to, thanks Ben for posting that. We've been able to take this and do it with thousands of people to understand basically a set of parameters where you should probably be set or what numbers would work for you in terms of several different breathing protocols that you could play with. All right. And that is on that breath test calculator. There are seven different protocols that that come under that. You can input your test. The max exhale test is important to understand so that you can actually set some slower uh, rhythm breathing um, in order to Hey, Brian, we lost your audio. Uh, Went on mute. There you go. Um, Where'd it go on mute? (laughs) Okay. So the breath test calculator is important. Using it will give you a CO2 tolerance test. It's free. It'll give you seven different protocols. Play with the different protocols. These are good to understand which one feels best for you. One of the key things to understand about breathing is that not everybody fits into the same bucket. And the reason is, is all of the stuff I've just gone over. If your physiology isn't in place, if your CO2 tolerance is different than mine, if we were to do the same breathing protocol, I'm going to have a different reaction than you are. If a certain rhythm sets me off, say I deal with anxiety, a lot of anxiety, I can tell you right now, most of those people shouldn't be doing a lot of breath hold work because it sets them off right? And so it spins people out a little bit more when doing that. That being said, there are seven protocols on that page for a reason. All right. So understanding principles. um, We want to look at this in terms of the fact that stress is a necessary fact of life. It is going nowhere. It's why you're alive. It's why you wake up in the morning. It is a part of things. Okay. We want to build resilience to stress. It turns out CO2 is right at the heart of that. So all things, including stress, are poison and thus dose dependent. Understand that. What are boundaries? If you don't understand your own physiological boundaries and you continue to overshoot that, you don't get to blame the world for your problems. Okay? Pay attention to how you're managing stress. Okay? Energy deficit is critical. Energy surplus shortens the adaptive process. Chronic exposure to energy surplus shortens your life. Facts. 
all stress needs transitions, okay? No, transi no transition equals closer to chronic exposure, big learning experience or worse, none, okay? Just keep repeating the same thing over and over. Adaptation equals learning. Learning is adaptation. Stay fucking curious. Sorry. Stay curious, people. I promise you, you will learn and you will adapt far better. Okay. It is the answer. Problem solver is what somebody who is in an adaptive process is doing. Example, and here's the big one. Sleep is your indicator of how well you did the other 16 hours of the day. So if you sleep like shit, and I do this all the time because I overdo it all the time, but I don't blame anybody but Brian. I blew it during the day. So it's time to reset and get that stuff dialed back. So understanding these principles, state is our psychology. An increase in respiration rate is directly tied into being overwhelmed, anxiousness, and too stressed. Understand that. Breathing is directly tied into our nervous system. Therefore, slowing it down brings in more parasympathetic tone, okay? You can calm yourself instantly down, no matter the situation, if you slow the breathing down. Speeding up your respiration rate increases sympathetic tone. From a physiological side, what, your breathe, what is your breathing telling you? Breathing is directly tied into metabolic function, how we use aerobic and anaerobic processes or energy. If my mouth opens, guess what? I am leaning more towards anaerobic energy, short-term energy. Make it short and fast, then get back to the nose, all right? Mechanics, movement. Can you breathe through your nose in a position or in, in sub-maximal work? Maximal work is probably going to require you to breathe through your mouth. Anything below maximal work, you should be able to breathe through your nose. If you can't, it's okay. You've got some work to do. And I promise you, the fruit you will bear will be far better than you thought it could ever be if you stick in it for the long, the long haul. Explore the edges of your limitations and movement patterns with breathing. There's a reason yoga is largely the oldest movement practice we know of and has breath work tied to the foundation of it, okay? A mouth open is sympathetic dominant and therefore more anaerobic in nature and also means I can get away with really poor movement patterns, okay? So it's all interconnected. There are consequences for everything in nature and we our nature, no matter how hard we try to change that. So understand the principles of how energy works. That's it, man. Energy works through you, through this vehicle of breathing. Okay. Awareness. What is my current state and what can I control? What do I want to be doing? What, how do I want to be? Control that shit. Tools. Can I use these to shift my state or stressor. This simply means or equals adaptability. All right. Final stuff right here. Three breaths, people. Inhale for me. All the way in and all the way out. All the way in. All the way out. All the way in. All the way out. And hold on the out and stomp in place as fast as you can. Go, 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 go. Stomp, 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 stomp. When you need to breathe, just go back to normal breathing. Or in three, two, one, no matter where you're at, inhale for me. Stop stomping and exhale. Inhale and exhale. And hold. Stomp in place. Stomp, 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 stomp. Go, 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 go. You got this. No matter where you're at, stop. Inhale for me. And exhale all the way. Hold your breath. Stomp in place. Go, 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 go
Now, when you need to breathe on your dime, find that carotid artery. Here's what you're doing. Inhale and progressively slower your exhales. Do this five to 10 times. Pay attention to that pulse. Progressively slow your exhale. Don't worry about the inhale. Take it all the way in though. Pay attention to that pulse. Slow that exhale down just a little bit more. And slow that exhale down just a little bit more. And a little bit more each time. Going to give you 10 more seconds of this. What happened? Don't tell me. I already know. <laughs> I'm betting, because I've rarely seen anybody say that their pulse went faster than it did the last time we did this, right? That your pulse dropped a lot quicker due to the fact that you exhaled slower. This is a direct indication that you have lowered the intensity of what's going on in your situation. This can happen in an emotional situation, in an argument, which... Please do that there. This can happen when you are trying to recover from hard work, intervals, whatever, or even when you're working out or going for a walk. Get to control your breathing and slow your ass down a little bit more in order to control what's going on, all right? I leave you with this story, and then I'll let you go dig through the research of what we're talking about. By design, the tortoise and the hare, you have this story that has existed for eons of two animals that are doing the same distance, and yet one is using one system and one is using the other. So we've got an animal, the hare, using its sympathetic nervous system and anaerobic energy, and you've got the tortoise using aerobic energy and it's at a parasympathetic nervous system, right? This is the difference between two ATP molecules and 32 for energy. That is an astronomical amount of difference in efficiency right there. One's life expectancy is nine years. The other one is greater than 80, sometimes over 120 years. One's resting heart rate is 135. The other is 10. One's res respiration rate is 45 and the other is four. Nature created an animal that exists that has no means of a sympathetic nervous system or anaerobic cellular respiration. It can only hide in its shell. And it does a damn good job of staying alive and doing things in a way that 90% of the energy I'm supposed to be using is done as well. The more you grab a hold of how well you use oxygen, the better the entire system works from the brain to the physiology. All of our research is located that I actually kind of integrated into this. Um, I did not talk about things that have not been cited or used. Um, in fact, there's some great stuff, three specific studies, the one on disease um, and civilization that I, that I cited is called, are, are the diseases of civilization caused by learnt behavior, not the stress itself? This is by Andras Sichter. Um, it's on uh, the Health and Human Performance Foundation. You can find that at hhp-foundation.org, or you can go to the Instagram handle at hhpfoundation. Um, and there is a ton of research navigating all of this stuff and how not only nasal breathing and respiration changes the brain, but the physiology, um, how panic attack, anxiety, the suffocation alarm system, um, CO2 tolerance is all integrated into this stuff. And it's really just looking at this stuff with an overview and understanding the principles of why we're, why and how we're using energy. So, no matter where you go with this, whether you're speeding up the breathing or slowing it down, you now understand what it does, why it does it. So when you're doing it, understand the intention that you're trying to seek through an adaptive process learning. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, 
you can find me. I'm sure uh, Neurohacker's got this all linked up. I appreciate Neurohacker very much for uh, bringing me on to do this. I'm a big fan of their work. I um, do my uh, Eternus every morning during the week um, to make sure that, that, that I'm influencing that mitochondria as best I can right after I do my breath work. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, this was phenomenal. Uh, this is a, the perfect primer for this whole series that we're doing is to really get a deep understanding of the why and the science and the how behind all of this and the next three that we're going to be doing over the next uh every wednesday for the next uh, month of october is really going to go deep into the practices so you're going to get introduced to three different breathwork coaches that people are uh, doing this work in different ways and different practices that are all all within this space so having the understanding of this was phenomenal riveting i saw tons of comments about that as well so sincerely sincerely thank you for your time and your work and your education brian this was profound yeah you're welcome man you're welcome thank you i, I appreciate everybody on here all the all the good comments and everybody sticking around to listen to this stuff i i'm just uh i'm enamored with it so it um, it shows because we we had yeah. we had a ton of people come on early and I think hardly anybody dropped off. We had a ton of people throughout this. So if you guys want to awesome. learn more, um, I put the website uh, in. Oh yeah, and link. I've got oh. something for everybody who came on to this. Hold That's on, <laughs> don't go anywhere. What did I? Where is it at? All right. Um, okay. So if you go to shiftadapt.com, you click on performance, you can sign up. For our membership, if you use the code, here it is, all capitals, Neurohacker POD, okay, you will get a month free of behind the wall of what we do, which is only 30 bucks a month, but it's a month free to get started and understand this. Um, there's integrated breath work in there. There is training in there that talks about breathing gears, but more importantly, Every single webinar that we do is housed in our membership area for free, okay? It is Neurohacker Pod. Yes, Erica uh, just posted that. Um, Neurohacker Pod, have fun with it. Most of you will probably just want to absorb the webinars. The webinars are a very, very deep dive into everything but broken up of what we just did. We actually have a new one coming up on pain we're, we're doing with the guys from Integrated uh, uh, Kinetic Neurology. Phenomenal. Thank you. Yes, thank you, you so much. It. Um, we're going to have a recording of all this. So every, most everyone stayed throughout the whole thing, which I sincerely appreciate and love. That's awesome that you guys are just that into it and curious. I saw that in the comments as well. But uh, like me, if you're going to want to watch this again and just go through it, we're going to have a recording of that. So look out for that at neurohacker.com uh, slash breathwork. And we'll be sharing it out on our social media as well. And also go to neurohacker.com slash breathwork. All the other, the next three events are all there. So you can add them to your calendar. So you make sure you're uh, around and available and in tune for those. And we hope you join us, especially having this primer education now putting that into practice with the actual practice of the breath work and doing the work. It's going to be just amazing. So I'm super excited about this whole month of content. Thank you guys. Thank you, Brian. Uh, have a phenomenal day. Love you guys all. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. All right. Thank you guys. Thanks, Ben. Yes. Yeah, the website again. Let me type it out for you guys in the chats. Neurohacker.com slash breathwork is the website you're going to want to go to. This is where we have just all the information about all of the uh, all these events that we're doing. So um, we'll be putting the recordings on there as well, and we'll be teasing them out and sharing them on our social media. So if you're not following us on social, please do so. Um, at Neurohacker on Instagram, at Neurohacker Collective on Facebook. Those are the two big ones. We're on Twitter as well, at The Neurohacker. But Instagram and Facebook are the, the main ones that we play on right now. So neurohacker.com slash breathwork is the site where we're going to be saving all this. Again, thank you guys so much for joining us, tuning in and sharing your afternoon with us. I sincerely appreciate it and have a phenomenal day. See you guys.